For hundreds of years, suspicions of a plot to take over America have swirled around the Freemasons, the world's oldest secret society. Freemasons led the revolution, played critical roles in the Declaration of Independence, the Constitution, the design of our nation's capital. The untold story of the Freemasons in America reveals secret codes, patterns taken from the stars, murder, and a radically new picture of the nation's founding fathers. Washington, D.C., one of the most photographed cities in the world. Its monuments are powerful and familiar, its history well known. Or is it? In recent years, a gathering storm of suspicions has brought renewed interest in an old idea. That the United States is somehow under the control of a powerful secret society. An innocent seeming worldwide civic organization with nearly two million members in the United States, the Freemasons. And that Washington DC is ground zero for that conspiracy. We know that Dan Brown, the author of The Da Vinci Code, intends to set his sequel to The Da Vinci Code against the backdrop of Freemasonry and some of these interesting histories and mysteries that go back to the founding of America. The symbols that reveal the Freemasons' presence, whisper the rumors, are all around us, hidden in plain sight. Some are obvious, like the compass and square, a public sign found on every Freemason lodge. The G in the center refers, the Freemasons say, to God, the grand architect of the universe. Other Freemason symbols are more subtle. Even on the dollar bill, the theories allege, are secret codes understood by Freemasons everywhere to mean that the plot to take over America is going well. Scholars find the idea ludicrous. They build this conspiracy theory and they weave it together until it's a huge giant thing. The Masons are just an element of it because it includes the CIA, the KGB, the PTA and every other alphabet thing. Of course they include the Masons because the Masons have secrets. Anti-Masons talk a lot about the Masons trying to take over the world, the new world order, you know. Do they really think that people like George Washington, like Benjamin Franklin, were engaged in a conspiracy to take over the world? The truth about the Freemasons in America may be even stranger than the conspiracy theories. The story begins in England, in the days of the founding Freemason fathers. No one knows exactly how it happened, but the medieval Free Stone Masons Guild was transformed in the 1700s by politically minded noblemen into an entirely separate organization. These new Freemasons wanted a secret club to advance their own blend of enlightenment ideals, science, reason, equality, and freedom of thought. I think it's important to see Freemasonry as a repository of intellectual knowledge, scientific knowledge, that by definition had to develop as a secret society because of the hegemony of the church in earlier times. In the late 1730s, the Pope issues a papal bull stating that Roman Catholics cannot join the fraternity because Freemasonry at its heart is about breaking down religious barriers. It's bringing together people of different religious origins. And for people who believe that the, the church is the center of things and that other organizations delude it, Freemasonry is a frightening kind of thing. It caught like a wildfire because it represented a new way of thinking about the world that was the wave of the future. Great thinkers like Voltaire in France, people like Mozart composing the magic flute, which is a Masonic allegory. Adam Smith, uh, David Hume, people we associate with the ideas that then led to the American Revolution. Benjamin Franklin was one of the first Americans to join the secret society. He underwent the bizarre ritual of the Freemason initiation ceremony in Philadelphia in 1731. These rituals used by Freemasons are undoubtedly of ancient Jewish 
origin, very old Jewish origin, going back to the time of Solomon, 3,000 years probably. It is about death and resurrection, which is at the heart of the concept of Freemasonry. Each Freemason is physically resurrected from a symbolic death. The Freemasons' secrecy and acceptance of men of different religious groups made them targets of suspicion. In the 1730s in America, there's a good deal of talk, what is masonry secret? It mattered if you were a Presbyterian or if you were a Baptist. So, so masonry, in blurring those kind of lines, seems to many people to be upending some of the, some of the foundations of society. Freemasonry spread throughout the colonies. By the 1770s, revolution was in the air, with American Freemasons like Paul Revere taking the lead. The Boston Tea Party is one point at which you can see Freemasons actually um, being closely involved with one of the central events of the American Revolution. Because we know the Green Dragon Tavern in Boston, the meeting place of one of the key groups of Masons. This is the center of a lot of the meetings about the Tea Party. In fact, there's a drawing of the Green Dragon Tavern from this period that actually somebody has written on there. This is where we planned what becomes the Boston Tea Party. Paul Revere, John Hancock, and Joseph Warren are all members of the Lodge. Okay, we're talking about firebrand liberals. This Lodge doesn't meet that night. It's actually written in the minutes that we were involved with the tea. One cannot truly understand how the American experiment came to be, how the ideals of the American Revolution flourished without studying the role of Freemasonry. Masons are dangerous. A Mason learns that he or she has a free will. A Mason is very dangerous when it comes to systems of government that try to oppress the free mind of an individual. With the Mason-influenced revolution underway and the new nation defining itself, Freemason Ben Franklin suggested an important change to Thomas Jefferson's draft of the Declaration of Independence. We hold these truths to be sacred and undeniable. The word sacred bothered Franklin, by now the grand master of the Pennsylvania Freemasons. A Freemason's America, in accordance with advanced Enlightenment ideas, would be bound by reason, not by faith. Franklin found a more acceptable word, self-evident. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal. The Declaration of Independence is part of the same intellectual world as early Freemasonry. It's a world where God still exists, but you don't emphasize the specific things that divide you about religion. These individuals were not primarily Christians in their belief system. They saw themselves as Christians in a very broadly defined light. They talked about divine providence. They didn't talk about God. They talked about uh, belief in man and the importance of doing good works on, in this life, on this earth. They talked about tolerance, progress, the need for men to band together to change society. Of the 56 men to sign the Declaration of Independence, nine were openly Freemasons, including the presiding officer, John Hancock. But America's most important founding Freemason was none other than George Washington. Now the fact that Washington is a Freemason is of enormous significance. George Washington joined, even when he was just 20 years old, so anxious was he to join the fraternity. With the War for Independence underway, General Washington struggled to transform the ragtag Continental Army into a unified fighting force. Freemason lodges set up inside army camps provided a place for discussion and the roots of the first truly American identity. You found that religious organizations were largely segregated by colony, with Calvinists to the north, Quakers in, in the middle, Anglicans to the south. Uh, but Freemasonry was a group that uh, transcended the boundaries. It provides a common bond of friendship that is so essential in maintaining esprit de corps. About 40 percent 
of all the officers belonged to the fraternity and quite often met within lodges that were held in the army camps. But the war did not begin well for the Americans. Washington knew that without more supplies and better officers, the revolution was doomed. Washington's Freemason brother, Ben Franklin, took care of that problem, persuading the King of France to enter the war on America's side. Franklin was an ambassador to Paris, to France, and, and you hear, of course, in Tech well, he used his connections in France. What were those connections? He was a Freemason. He was very active in Freemasonry. In fact, Benjamin Franklin guided Voltaire in his initiation in the Lodge of the Nine Muses in Paris. I mean, he was so well connected. He used the Masonic network to recruit great generals and officers from around Europe who were willing to come, serve under another Mason, George Washington, fight for the ideals of the American Revolution because those were also Masonic ideals. Help came from German Baron von Steuben, a Freemason who guided Washington's troops through the hardships of Valley Forge, and the Marquis de Lafayette, a Freemason who helped lead America to the ultimate victory over the British at Yorktown. Without the Freemason leadership, the revolution might never have been won. With Washington there and with so many other figures, by the time the revolution is over, most Americans have come to see Masonry as a peculiarly patriotic, nationalistic organization. America was free. When Washington swore his oath of office in 1789 on a Bible borrowed from a Masonic lodge held by a fellow Mason, the fraternity had a unique opportunity to help shape their new nation. And they took it. As Americans learn about Freemason history and the founding of this country, they will find some of the episodes to be shocking, strange, bizarre. In the first days of the Republic, President George Washington, a Freemason worshipful master, took a strong hand in designing the capital city that would bear his name. George Washington, he's intimately involved with his creation, the creation of this new capital city right near his home. In the summer of 1791, the president hired a Revolutionary War veteran, Major Pierre Charles L'Enfant, to work on the design of the city. L'Enfant's plan would reflect Washington's deepest beliefs, starting with the Freemason president's insistence that the district be set on an exact 10-mile square. The city was designed scientifically and geometrically. Why? To send a very important message that unlike the old order, where the reliance was on religion mainly to govern the affairs of the people, under the new order, the reliance is going to be mainly on reason, the scientific method, geometry, to govern the affairs of the people. Many hands would get involved. Thomas Jefferson drew the initial street plan, an uncompromising grid. L'Enfant added the distinctive radial streets, shooting off at angles from focal points like the Capitol. Andrew Ellicott, Benjamin Banneker, and others would all contribute. None known to be Freemasons, but to many members of the fraternity, the result reflects a uniquely Freemason vision of America. It reflects ideals of architecture and masonry espoused by the fraternity. You can see the various uh, symbols of geometry that we use in Freemasonry. The triangle, the concept of the three, the square, the concept of the four. The Freemasons used countless shapes and symbols to educate initiates in the ways of what was called the craft. The Masons in the 1700s understood the power of symbols to communicate deep psychological ideas, complex political ideas. They're almost Zen-like in how simple they appear and yet how profound they might be. Some of them, even the scholars and experts, haven't decoded. 
The most well-known Freemason symbol is the sign of the linked compass and square. These simple tools of the medieval stonemasons remind the Freemason to deal honestly, on the square, and to live a measured and moral life. Freemason Akram Elias sees the compass and square as part of the capital's Masonic design. The coded symbols built into the city began with Washington, he believes, but their development has continued through the centuries. The top of the compass is the capital. One axis of the compass goes to the White House. The other one is from the capital to the Jefferson Memorial. And then the square is from the Lincoln Memorial to the White House, Lincoln to Jefferson. For this square and compass to be completed, the Jefferson Memorial needed to be where it is today. And you know, that part of the river was landfilled for about six years, from 1933 to 39, under Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Oops, happened to be a mason, by the way, but I don't know. It's probably coincidence. Of course it's coincidence. Not even all masons agree. Now, Akram and I do not see eye to eye, and he's going to give you this lengthy explanation of how Washington was moved by his Masonic ideals to incorporate the 10-mile square as a symbol of the perfection of the city, the perfection of uh, the, the, the United States government, uh, all based upon Masonic ideals. If you take any rectangular grid pattern, you superimpose on it a radial design, you cannot avoid creating something that will look like a square encompasses. And so, no, I don't see him there at all. It's like an Etch-a-Sketch. You start to trace things. If you go really far out, you're going to see any conceivable Masonic symbol is there somewhere. I can look at the streets of Washington and also find a piggy and a horsey. Uh, I don't think they're there. Lower the stone! Imbued with a Freemason code or not, the nation celebrated the founding of its new capital with great patriotic fervor, and Freemasons played the central role in 1793, the Freemasons were asked to lay the cornerstone of the United States Capitol. Washington himself, dressed in his full Masonic regalia, performs a Masonic ritual, which includes libations of corn, wine, and oil. Now, maize is a symbol of abundance, of prosperity. Oil is a symbol of peace. And wine is a symbol of happiness. Thomas Jefferson talks about the Capitol as being a, a temple, the first temple dedicated to the sovereignty of the people. They're acting in some ways as sort of priests of this new nation. They are taking on a sacred function. The president's public embrace of Freemasonry set the fraternity on an uninterrupted course toward power and influence. But that power would suddenly collapse in 1826 with a charge of murder. With George Washington as president and Freemason, the secret society grew more public, gaining membership, power, and influence throughout the young United States. Freemasonry became very popular, and as a result of that, some people started questioning, said, what is happening here? It seems like everywhere you turn, you find a Mason. Are these guys taking over the country? Are they, do they have their own secret plot or something? The Freemasons were soon the center of America's first conspiracy theory. It began in France, where the French Revolution turned into Robespierre's reign of terror. Thousands were sent to the guillotine in the name of liberty. In 1798, in America, a shocking book appeared that claimed the French Revolution and the terror that followed were really the work of a small devil-worshipping society that hid under the cover of the Society of Freemasons, the Illuminati. The Illuminati, fascinating, powerful, connotative reference cultish, secret, symbolic rituals. The Illuminati was a real historical movement created, interestingly, in the year 1776 in Bavaria. And they did attempt to foment revolutions. And they did spread in secret to some other European countries. 
a number of people begin to raise fears that the Illuminati have come to America, but they're also trying to create that same sort of thing. George Washington was both president and the country's most famous Freemason. If the country believed the Freemasons were corrupt, the government might collapse. George Washington receives letters from important people in American society asking him to declare that he is not a Freemason. And George Washington replies, sort of, I'm not now and never have been a member of the Illuminati. And he doesn't denounce Freemasonry. The Freemason Illuminati conspiracy theory was based on bad facts. The historical record shows that the Illuminati existed as a group for less than 10 years. The Illuminati were abolished in 1785 with public trials and banishments. But the Freemasons would never completely escape from the shadow of the Illuminati. Against a growing tide of suspicion, by the 1820s, Freemasons were in power all over the country, in small towns, in state houses, and with the election of Freemason James Monroe in the White House as well. But the Masons' position of power and influence was about to end with a crime and a cover-up. Initiation rituals are at the core of Freemasonry. These strange ceremonies draw on traditions thousands of years old. Every Freemason experiences them and swears an oath, promising death to anyone who reveals their secrets. In 1826, William Morgan violated that oath. An ex-Freemason in the western New York state town of Batavia, Morgan announced plans to publish a book exposing every detail of even the highest, most secret Freemason rituals. Soon after, the heavy drinking Morgan was jailed on the trivial charge of defaulting on a $2.60 debt. For many Masons, these were the culmination, the most sacred moments within fraternal activity. The Masons in the area around him, they do all sorts of things to try to stop him from trying to speak to him try to burn down the printing press. And eventually they turn to kidnapping. They take him out of the prison and they ride with him off into the night. Morgan's never seen again. As the carriage pulled away, a witness heard Morgan cry out, murder, murder. Many people think he was killed, which is my view. Some people say he was sent to Canada, sent elsewhere. Four men all local masons were arrested and charged with kidnapping as the wheels of justice turn they don't turn very well because masons seem to be trying to cover this up you have you have masonic sheriffs packing juries you have masonic organizations seeming to try to remove witnesses from the area when the defendants were let off with light sentences a public outcry erupted even dewitt clinton the powerful governor of New York State and Freemason was suspected of conspiracy. Public opinion uh, convicted the Masons, all the Masons, not just a group of renegade out of control local Masons, but every Mason everywhere was guilty of the murder. Americans come to see Masonry in a new way. What had seemed to be the embodiment of everything that was right about America now seems to be the embodiment of everything that's wrong about America. Freemasonry seems to be an emblem of the compromises, of the failures of this world, a world which claimed to be equal, but yet was deeply stratified, deeply divided. So Masons claimed to be about equality, but yet had kings, had high priests, had worshipful masters in their lodges. By the time of the presidential campaign of 1831, a burgeoning anti-Mason movement had coalesced into a powerful political force. The first third national party, quote unquote, in the United States was the anti-Masonic party. I mean, you could look how well, how narrowly defined <laughs> it was, you know. It was not like a, a libertarian party, you know, or a green party. It was like an anti-Masonic party. You create a party, a national party against something. The anti-Masons lost their presidential bid in 1832 to Andrew Jackson, a Democrat and a Freemason, but the damage had been done. Small-town preachers poured down condemnation on the Masons in their congregations, labeling them blasphemers, 
atheists and expelled those who refused to quit the fraternity. New England school teachers shut their classroom doors to the children of Freemasons. A group of wives and mothers even issued dark warnings about unnatural acts committed inside the all-male Masonic lodges. In some places, it just devastates Freemasonry. The Vermont Grand Lodge simply closes up. They decide they can't continue to meet. The Michigan Grand Lodge has the same experience. In New York, in New England, Freemasonry was virtually destroyed. Uh, in Maryland, where my membership is, I believe we lost half our lodges. The Freemasons might have disappeared from America in the wake of what was known as the Morgan Affair. But the Freemasons would rise again, propelled by a mysterious, charismatic leader who would transform the fraternity and lead to charges that the Freemasons were secretly in league with the devil. The Freemasons' rise in America took a staggering blow with the kidnapping and disappearance of William Morgan in the 1820s. Over the next 20 years, the Freemasons reinvented themselves as a large but low-profile charitable organization. Masons no longer boast about how powerful they are. They no longer talk about how God created their fraternity. So masonry comes back, and by the 1860s, it is beginning to grow again in dramatic scale. No one was more responsible for the Freemasons' growth in the 19th century than the controversial figure of Albert Pike. His work would transform the Freemasons and provide the fuel for every Freemason conspiracy theory to come. Pike made a tremendous contribution to Freemasonry, but also Albert Pike as a person is one of the most controversial, you know, Freemasons. Pike's work would bring charges of racism, Satanism, and charges that a hidden cabal of leaders inside the society secretly directed a Freemason conspiracy to rule America. He was 300 pounds, he was over six feet tall, and he looked for all the world like Merlin the Magician. He was a Renaissance man in his knowledge and interests. One of the main things that he accomplished was rewriting the rituals. The rituals, uh, those allegorical stories that teach the ethical and moral lessons. He wrote this incredible volume, Morals and Dogma, and he just went to town with all of the lure of uh, ancient uh, religion, philosophy, and um, uh, esoteric things of all kinds. He might mention druids or agnostics or whatever, as well as very Christian themes, very classical themes. Pike combined ancient religions, astrology, myths, and legends to create an elaborate new set of 33 Masonic initiations. The conspiracy theories claim that these 33 strange ceremonies and degrees hold the key to understanding the truth about the Freemasons. It's a philosophical system which teaches moral instruction. We have the Lodge of Perfection, which is the first 14 degrees, the Chapter of Rose Croix, the Council of Kadosh, and a Consistory of Masters of the Royal Secret. Conspiracy theorists charge that these higher degrees are taught the true nature of the Freemason conspiracy, and that this truth is hidden from ordinary Masons. They point to Pike's own words, which seem to teach the art of deception. The first three degrees are but the outer court of the temple. Part of the symbols are displayed there to the initiate, but he is intentionally misled by false interpretations. Their true explication is reserved for the adepts, the princes of masonry. The notion that the higher degrees conceal information from the lower degrees is actually taken out of context. The statement occurs in Morals and Dogma uh, in the chapter on the Knight's Kadosh, which is the ritual that reenacts the Knight Templar legend. The Knight's Templar were the medieval monks that fought in the Crusades that were destroyed by Pope Clement V and King Philip the Fair of France. Now, Pike taught that that degree should warn us about the abuses of power. He saw Pope Clement V and Philip the Fair as potential dangers to mankind and believed the early Masons veiled the meaning in allegories in the lower degrees to keep their ceremonies secret. Pike, 
who had been a Confederate Brigadier General in the Civil War, is also the source of another Freemason mystery, the question of his supposed relationship with the Ku Klux Klan. I've read that he supposedly wrote the rituals of the KKK. This is simply not true. I've looked through our entire collection of manuscripts of original writings by Pike, his personal correspondence from the period of the Civil War on up to the time that he died. There's not a single reference to the KKK. There's no evidence that Pike was ever a member, much less that he wrote the rituals. In an 1868 newspaper editorial, Pike did write that nothing much would come of the Klan, as it was poorly organized. He argued instead for a different secret society. We would unite every white man in the South, he wrote, who is opposed to Negro suffrage into one great order of Southern Brotherhood, whose very existence should be concealed from all but its members. It's a bit like Thomas Jefferson. You know, it's, there are sometimes contradictions that you cannot reconcile. I mean, he's a great founding father, you know, main drafter of the Declaration of Independence, yes, yet he's, his attitude towards slavery, you know, and what he did privately. I mean, how can you have these two people be the same? Well, they are. They are, and I guess we're human beings. Pike's Freemason elite is the 33rd degree, called the Inspectors General. To this day, this invitation-only group governs the Freemasons in Pike's southern jurisdiction. 33rd degree Masons have included President Harry Truman, General Douglas MacArthur, and the once powerful and feared FBI director J. Edgar Hoover. Every one of them charged the conspiracy theories, manipulated events to help maintain control of America. The lack of evidence only seems to encourage the true believers. They accuse Freemasons of doing wicked, terrible things, um, and when you tell them that it just doesn't happen, they, they just simply say, well, you don't know yet, you're not high enough. Well, I know plenty of extremely senior uh, Freemasons, Grand Masters of running countries, and I know exactly what they know, because they ask me for advice on certain things. Um, and there is no high level. Um, it just doesn't exist. The ultimate charge against the Freemasons is that they worship the devil. The accusation seems to stem from a single paragraph in Pike's 861-page book, Morals and Dogma. Lucifer, the son of the morning, is it he who bears the light and with its splendors intolerable, blind, feeble, sensual, or selfish souls? Doubt it not. The morning star is the planet Venus. In Latin, it's called Lucifer, which means literally light bearer, because it rises just before the sun comes. And so it, it, it is the bringer of the light. And what he meant is that it heralds the dawn and brings light to mankind. And unfortunately, in other contexts, Lucifer is Satan, and away you go with that. And so he appeared to be praising and lauding Satan, which was never his meaning, and it would be very wrong to take it that way. The Lucifer myth was exploited by a French author, pen name Leo Taxel, who wrote a wildly popular series of pamphlets and books denouncing masonry in the 1890s. But in 1897, Taxel proudly revealed that his depiction of Albert Pike as a Satanist was a complete and utter hoax. But for the Freemasons, the genie was out of the bottle. If you see the word Lucifer in Pike's book, and Taxel has told you that he's the sovereign pontiff of Lucifer, well, it, it all comes together. Those, those poor Masons, they're misled by the evil inner circle. And to the present, people have breathlessly told their friends, do you realize what the Masons are doing? And I suspect these are the same people that, that send an email and say, did you hear about the poor woman who dried her poodle in a microwave? Modern-day zealots even see signs of Taxel's devil in the layout of the streets of Washington, D.C. In the layout of Washington, you will find an image of an inverted five-pointed star. You're going to see two of the points sticking up, and away you go. You've got now a satanic image, and they believe that it was written into the design of Washington. <laughs> Very few rational people may truly believe the devil's face is embedded in the streets of Washington. 
But no Freemason mystery is more widespread than the rumors that swirl around the Great Seal of the United States and the strange symbols that appear on the $1 bill. By the 20th century, the Freemasons were deeply ingrained in American life. Their House of the Temple, completed in 1915, stands exactly 13 blocks from the White House. High above the 33 entrance steps, one for each Freemason degree, stands an unfinished 13-step pyramid, exactly the same design that appears on the back of the United States $1 bill. For generations, Americans have wondered about the possibility of a secret Freemason code hidden on the dollar bill. People will tell you that it was put there by the Freemasons, that there are secret words and anagrams, that if you draw a hexagram around the Great Seal, the letters that it connects are M-A-S-O-N, that 1776 is the year that the Illuminati of Bavaria was formed, that our all-seeing eye and unfinished pyramid are all there as our way of telling the world that we are in charge. Hogwash. The symbols on the dollar bill are derived from the great seal of the United States. The familiar American bald eagle appears on the front. The reverse features the mysterious pyramid and an all-seeing eye. The true story of the Great Seal begins with a committee formed the same day the Declaration of Independence was signed, July 4, 1776. It was designed by four separate committees over six years. Only one Freemason served on any of the committees, and that was Benjamin Franklin. Franklin served on the first committee, and he proposed as a design Moses standing on the banks of the Red Sea, parting the waters, while in the foreground were the children of Israel and in the background were Pharaoh and his hosts. The final design was approved by Congress in 1782. George Washington, Ben Franklin, and other founding fathers were all Freemasons. Every symbol on the Great Seal would share both their Freemason heritage and their dreams for the new nation. Beginning with the incomplete pyramid, a symbol for both the Freemasons and their founding fathers. The pyramid is not unique to Mason, but Masons give it a great significance. You see, Masons are builders. So we're talking here about the American experiment. It's a building process. The fact that it's uncompleted, you know, this is the explanation that's given by the, the State Department and the SEAL, means that we have not completed and perfected our nation yet. We're still working on it, and we certainly are. The pyramid is a familiar symbol. The eye emanating light is not. Possibly derived from the Egyptian god's eye, by the Renaissance, the eye had become a common symbol for the all-seeing eye of the Christian god, watching over all of creation. The Freemasons would adopt the all-seeing eye, but not until 14 years after it first appeared on the Great Seal. For the Founding Fathers, the all-seeing eye was a way of acknowledging God without any reference to a specific church. They have an all-seeing eye to suggest the notion that somehow, without a specific Christian God concept, someone, some being, some presence is overlooking the world. In masonry, the concept is very simple. To defeat ignorance, to defeat tyranny, to defeat fanaticism, the three eternal enemies of the free mind, of the Freemason, you need to seek light. You need to become an enlightened citizen. No part of the Great Seal is more controversial than the Latin phrase novus ordo seclorum. The designer, Charles Thompson, a non-Mason, borrowed the words from a 2,000-year-old Latin poem, translated the phrase reads, New Order of the Ages, a reference to the dawn of the American era. The words have no direct connection to Freemasonry at all. The idea of a new social order, which is what I think the Novo Order Seclorum means, is the idea that we are building a new society in uh, the early United States. Talking about here building a new experiment, building a new republic, building a new order. 
that is different from the old order, which was represented by an absolutist monarchy in an absolutist church. And one of the ways that I think it's mistranslated is new secular order, with the emphasis being on rooting out uh, religion. So people who look at this and see these conspiracy theories that are missing the point, really, of the history of the American Revolution and its ideals. The Founding Fathers' ideals are embodied in Washington, D.C., the city they built as a tribute to democracy. A new theory, first published by a French author in 1979, claims that the Freemasons among the Founding Fathers also built a secret code into Washington, making the entire city one vast pagan altar, a tribute to a goddess. The theory begins with the so-called Federal Triangle, the Washington Monument, the Capitol Building, and the White House. The significance, says the theory, can be found in the stars above. Every year between August 10th and 15th, just after sunset, three bright stars align directly over the Federal Triangle. You'll be looking at these three stars, Arcturus, Regulus, and Spica. Arcturus appears above the Washington Monument, Regulus above the White House, and Spica above the Capitol. In the triangle, hovering over the city's most important buildings shines the constellation Virgo, the Virgin Goddess. This strange annual alignment might be a coincidence, or it might have been deliberately created by Freemasons like George Washington, practicing a strange and ancient religion. And from this comes this theory that the entire city of Washington was oriented toward the Virgo symbol in the sky, which would be the Virgin, which if you trace it back can be Christian in nature, which would be the Virgin Mary. But if you trace it back far enough, you get right back to the Greek goddess Minerva or Isis, the Egyptian goddess. The idea of orienting your city to a goddess would be to seek to get the divine benevolence from that goddess. It seems an absurd theory on the surface, but there is this enigmatic portrait of the first Freemason, President George Washington. Washington's son holds the central Freemason symbol of the compass. Washington, his wife, and his daughter clearly indicate three specific points on a map of Washington, D.C., a triangle, location unknown. Freemason leader Albert Pike did call for a painting of constellations featuring Virgo to be placed on the ceiling of every Freemason lodge. And 19th century Masons did often reproduce images of Virgo tended by a master Mason sometimes under her zodiac sign. In fact, the zodiac sign of Virgo appears repeatedly in Washington. The district has a total of 53 zodiacs, more than any other capital city in the world, including this image of Virgo rising on the statue of James Garfield, president and Freemason. As with so many Freemason mysteries, the truth about Virgo may never be known with 100% certainty. And while the Freemasons have embodied the cherished American values of independence, equality, and brotherhood since the first days of the revolution, their long history of keeping secrets means that the Freemasons will never be entirely above suspicion. Having studied Freemasonry for so long, it's it seems very strange to me that people still see masonry as being something which has this extraordinarily wide-ranging impact on society and in a very bad kind of way. As a non-mason, as a scholar, I would have liked nothing more than to find some major Masonic conspiracy. And unfortunately for Mike Fame, the idea that there's a secret Masonic conspiracy just doesn't seem to hold up. The debate about who the Freemasons really are and what their impact has been on society here in America will most certainly continue. The myths, the rituals, 
and the secrecy that surround the Freemasons all act to keep the mysteries unsolved and the conspiracy theories alive.